Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Martha Campbell, and I'm MFA's Communications Manager, and I'm here to welcome you to tonight's Will Talk with Artists. Our digital discussion tonight is with abstract sculptor Elizabeth Kendall. Kendall or sorry, Elizabeth works with lush white porcelain, wood, steel, and vibrant glass, inventing abstract wall pieces and vessels inspired by her own memories and experiences. I would also like to introduce the host of our show, Will Scott. Will is an art historian with an extensive career as a photographer and the former head of adult programs for the National Gallery of Art. He is uniquely qualified to help bridge the gap between artists and the public, and he'll be our guide into the art world tonight. Thank you, Martha, and thank you for your usual uh, great support. I'm turning off my phone as you request that I do. Um, <laughs> if, it, if it beeps, then Martha has to edit that beep out. Um, and Elizabeth, thank you for agreeing to uh, participate. It's great to have uh, people who do more than just paint and photograph. Uh, and uh, your work is certainly fascinating on lots of levels, but first of all, because it is so distinctive. Uh, uh, the way you use porcelain is something that I've not seen before I became familiar with your work. So thanks for joining us. My pleasure, thank you. And, and because of that uh, use of porcelain and uh, the unusual abstract forms that Elizabeth creates, I'd like to jump right in uh, with the first image, if we could, Martha. And this is the kind of thing, uh, Elizabeth, that you do that I think is uh, stunning. And having taken one studio course in college, which was ceramics, and done a little reading over the years, I was always uh, under the impression, at least, that for, um, Porcelain was very hard to uh, work with, especially if you're going to bend and fold it into such unusual uh, abstract forms. Have I been mistaken all this time, or is this really a testament to your skill and originality? Well, I would like to say that, yes, it's absolutely a testament to my skill <laughs> and originality. Um, and I'll, I'll accept some credit for having worked with it for a long time and gotten to know it. Um, and I'll say that it is a material that's different than other clays. So it has some properties and behaviors that you need to pay attention to. And once you do, then it will work with you. As you know, it's kind of, it's a, it's a call, it's a game back and forth. It does this, I do that. If I set this up, this will happen. So there's a certain amount of understanding the physics and chemistry in the material. And then there's a certain amount of allowing the material to do what it wants to do. Well, that uh, actually opens up, uh, helps me understand uh, the challenges and the nature of the material, but it opens up a lot more questions to me. So can you give a specific example of what it is about the material that uh, sort of uh, it, it is, leads you to use it the way you do? Sure. Sure. So um, when I first started working with porcelain, um, I learned, I, I watched someone else do something that I thought was like, this is impossible, but he's doing it so it can be done. So I kind of mm -hmm. set myself up with that premise. Um, porcelain, if you find it in the ground, um, is usually found like at the top of the mountain where uh, pressure and time causes the material to compact and crush and um, coalesce, if you will. Um, so the particles are um, even and consistent in size and very pure. Whereas earthenware is found at the bottom of the hill near the water and to get there, it tumbled and moved and picked up debris and broke apart. So the particles are smaller and irregular and have a lot more uh, minerals, which of course cause color and so forth. So because the particles in porcelain are so even, there's very little in between them in a matrix, there's water and flat mm -hmm. disks. And when you move porcelain, you're sliding flat disks back and forth and they're floating in, a, in a water basically at the molecular level, not necessarily water. You can see it floating, but mm -hmm. it's that kind of behavior. And when the water goes away, if you don't have the porcelain structurally sound, it will collapse on itself. Mm -hmm. Or if you put too much water in, it will collapse on itself. So that means you have to pay attention to what's going on with it and um, so I, I'm not a patient person, so it works better for me than other clays because you work more quickly with it. You, I work with it softer and wetter because of some of its chemical properties. So I ended up working with it as large sheets and to me it suggested fabric. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so I'm working soft and wet and loose. So then that soft, wet looseness lends itself to think of it as fabric draping, folding, pleating, tucking, which is where the undulating kinds of forms come from. And so in this particular piece, Moonshadow, uh, are these forms which do look like they're pinched or collapsing uh, from their own weight, which is it or is it both? Um, they, are, they are intentionally formed. Uh, they're rolled very thin as a, as a sheet and then cut into strips. And then basically I form what are uh, cups without bottoms, if you will. Uh -huh. um, and so each one is handled and altered and kind of pinched and reshaped. And then this particular piece was formed inside a larger platter. So it was held during the firing to enable it not to slump and collapse mm -hmm. on itself, which it would have had it not had a, a structure underneath it to support it. Yeah. Uh, well, calling on my limited experience in the ceramic studio uh, and only using stoneware and those kinds of uh, clays, um, it, is it fair to say that you have to have more confidence and uh, technical expertise to work this way in porcelain? Because I think of those other clays that I'm familiar with and have used in the studio, you make them heavier and, and a little drier because it allows you to make more mistakes without destroying everything. Is that fair? Well, I think that's fair. And I think uh, time and trial and error have a lot to do with it. Um, I very intentionally decided that I wanted to work thin because mm -hmm. porcelain can get really thin unlike some other clays that when you get it too thin, it, it won't support itself. Whereas porcelain will, if you capture it at the right moment. Um, so having decided I wanted to work thin and that porcelain would allow me to do that, then it's a matter of doing it enough times to get um, the timing right of when to do what. Yeah, yeah. Um, most of us are probably familiar with porcelain, even those of us that are interested in the arts. Uh, in terms of uh, you know tableware, that kind of thing, where it's partially prized because of that nice ring it has and its translucency. Do you ever deliberately utilize those aspects in any of your work? Um, I am not interested in, of course, I like the ring that says it's structurally sound, um, but I'm not particularly interested in translucency. Um, I, I actually pick a clay that is more creamy than white, which is another attribute to porcelain is that sense of it being a really white, pure clay. Um, I am more interested in how it behaves like, like fabric than how it behaves, or paper, than how it behaves like clay. Oh, okay, that's fascinating. Well, where did you study? How did you learn this? Because this doesn't sound, I may be completely wrong, but it doesn't sound like something you could just learn on your own without taking an awfully long time to do that? Um, well, I, I studied by going to, uh, I didn't actually, I don't have a degree in ceramics. Um, I in fact have a degree in history. Um, and I decided at a certain point to, um, I was lucky to be able to explore the material and not have to worry about how many mugs I made, how many cups I made, what the bottom line was. So I was very lucky not to have to worry about that aspect of income. And, but I had children, small children, so I could not go to graduate school. Um, so what I did was I went to every workshop I could go to and met as many different people doing what I thought was interesting as I could. And then I asked them to set a course of study for me. What would you teach me if I were in your class? What questions would you ask? What things should I do? And, and then I tried out all these ideas. I would apply for a teapot show, a cup show, a this show, a that show. My assignment to myself was, all right, make the teapot, the cup, the this, the that. Doesn't matter whether you get into the show. It matters, did you learn and achieve something that was distinctive and successful from my own perspective? So it was kind of a, it was a long time. It did take yeah. a long time. Okay. So you really did do it on your own because you I set did. your own course and sought out the, the necessary training that was important to you at a critical time. If you don't mind me asking, how long ago, or, or maybe a better way of doing it is, 
how long did it take from the time you began to uh, work with porcelain until you were confident and could create these beautiful pieces? Um, well, I actually kind of, um, I think it actually came fairly quickly. This piece was done in 2004 and I switched to porcelain in um, 1999. Wow. Uh, and yeah. I was still making functional work. And I shifted from throwing traditional forms on the wheel because I was more interested in undulating forms and processes. So I shifted to hand building and the forms got looser and more fluid. And I'm working with porcelain, which tends to allow you to allow for slumping in a controlled way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a nice segue, uh, that uh, observation um, or that uh, point you just shared with us. What are you trying to accomplish in this? And the moon shadow title sort of, uh, you know, says something that's a little, uh, I think, easy to grasp. But often when you think something's easy to grasp, you're actually being misled. <laughs> you know, it's, it's more complex sure. than that. So how did you evolve uh, and create this piece? So this piece was one of a very, very early sculptural piece. And I was trying to get away from um, something that was small and intimate in the hand to something that was in a larger scale. So, but the tools, the building blocks, if you will, that I had were functional forms. So that's why it, I started mm -hmm. with this cup cylindrical form. Um, as uh, the meaning, and I wanted to make work that had a story behind it, if, even if it wasn't necessarily obvious um, other than this is something you can use every day. So um, this piece came from um, a phrase my mother had said when I was in high school. She said one night at dinner, she said, oh, look, the night is shining through the curtains. And what she was talking about was this very black sky with white curtains. And because if we were inside in the dining room, you couldn't see out because we, we were lit mm -hmm. up inside. So that um, phrase, which I thought was just quite poetic has has stuck with me for a long time and um so that became a resource for this kind of piece the black and white contrast um which gets into duality which gets into all sorts of things yeah, but it also yeah. comes from my parents wedding photo there's a woman in the white dress the man in the black tuxedo and that kind of um she's very short he was very tall so there's this intersection of opposites and then storytelling and memory um, that kind of all get twined into this piece. Yeah, well, that is very poetic uh, and proves that I was right to not think that this was easy to understand. Is it fair to say this is autobiographical? And would do you expect your viewers, your audience uh, to understand any of that or to simply make their own meaning out of the, uh, what you've presented? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried. Um, yes, it's autobiographical and it, it's larger because when you deal with black and white just in and of itself, that sets up all sorts of, of conversations about opposites. And, and um, I'm not concerned whether someone knows my story. In fact, I, I made variations on this piece. I made a few and one person bought it because um, for her, she was, a, she was an African-American woman and she loved having lots of black circles with one white circle. I mean, for her, it, it had a very different sure. story going forward. And that, I think that's great. Yeah, I do too. I think it's fascinating if you can hear what somebody, whether they purchase the work or, or just are spending a little time thinking about it and looking at it, hear what they say. And sometimes it's shocking. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's such a completely different thing, but that's just as meaningful, um, I yes. think. Um, I agree. Okay, Martha, let's move on to the next piece, please. Now, this is the one I think I was just saying to you and Martha that I couldn't quite uh, get my head around what it was and how it was created, uh, just looking at the image. And I still can't, even though it's larger now on my computer monitor than the thumbnails I was looking at. Um, and it is quite physically big. So uh, can you sort of break sure. it down part by part and then tell us what it was that you were hoping to accomplish uh, with it? Sure, yeah, so this, um, these are um, ceramic spindle slash bobbin forms that I threw on the wheel. Um, so oh. they're, they uh, are, they're small, they range from one inch to three inches um, and they're all individual. And unfortunately you need five or six piece images to, to really understand this piece. Um, 
it's a which I made again um, for an archway piece that I created originally that was referencing my grandmother's sewing room. So family mm -hmm. memory. So buttons and bobbins and spindles, mm -hmm. those are all kind of mm -hmm. referencing sewing things. And I made this archway, which was referencing the kind of sense of passing through with the, your whole family history surrounding you. Um, I had made that piece and it was installed in a, in a gallery exhibition. Then I was invited to produce a piece for a museum in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and they were reopening a museum there. So I decided, well, I, you know, New Bedford is the sailing, whaling yeah. kind of city. Yeah. So what I did was I um, created um, a boat structure. So the top of it, you can see is kind of a framed uh, boat hull flat with a plexiglass and it's got a steel structure around it. Um, and that is 10 feet long. Um, and it's the contour of it is based on the sh and the form of this whole boat um, was based on the shear lines for one of my husband's family boats. So it actually is a legitimate structure, realistic to scale of a 30 foot sailboat um, with the with the hull and the form of the boat. And then it's strung by with monofilament. Um, so you get this volume, but you also get these wonderful shadows bouncing off the walls. Uh, did you have collaborators that helped uh, manufacture the parts that are not ceramic? Um, yes, yes. I had someone who made the steel form and I cut the plexiglass. Um, so just this, in this case, the steel frame was welded by um, a metal worker who um, actually demonstrates at um, the, uh, George Washington's homes, Mount, Mount Vernon. So. Vernon. Uh, well, I'm going to ask a question of a kind that I, both as an artist and an art historian, really find annoying. <laughs> I, I hope you don't, uh, but <laughs> I can't resist. How long did it take you to assemble the whole thing and install? Oh, this was quite a project. Um, I was supposed to have. Uh, I mean, it, the whole project took months. I mean, I threw 50 pieces at a time while I was teaching a ceramics class, but each piece got touched seven times because it had to be cleaned and sanded and holes put in and stretched and blah, 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 blah. Um, and then I had planned to, I went up to Massachusetts with my daughter and we were gonna be up there for three days and install the whole piece. And they were in the process of finishing the museum and we got all these parts strung in this whole system of staging. And they said, oh, well, sorry, we're gonna do the floor. So you gotta go away and come back. So I had to take her home and she went back to school. So I spent a week on a ladder pretty much by myself all day long um, installing this piece. Do you feel that doing that gave you more ownership over the final result? Oh, it, halfway through, I thought this, I'm just crazy. And what am I, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> why, am I, why did I do this? To myself? Did, did it get to but stay there or? or it was up I, for a few months. I've actually recreated it in a different configuration um, at the, um, down in um, Portsmouth, Virginia. And then I've made two or three other archway pieces for different places. So I've reused these pieces um, many times. One of these and, days, I'll find a permanent home for it. But. Yeah, that's what I would really hope for, because it seems like it's kind of at risk, right? Every time you have to take it down and move it around, and it is it is stunning. And does it move? It does, yeah. They're, they're floating there. So you can, you know, wind will move it. You can, people can touch it. Um, every once in a while, you have to go in and kind of untwist them, because they mm -hmm. they will kind of spin on each other. Um, and if, yeah, and I would... If they Go come ahead. together with enough force, do they make that ringing sound? They will, porcelain? yes, yeah, they will. And if porcelain is much sturdier than you might think, it really isn't gonna, they, yeah. they'll hit each other and they'll be just fine. When you started, this is my last piece because you have so many more that I wanna uh, show them and, and talk about them. Um, when you started the piece, did you have the idea that it was going to have this uh, power of movement that would affect both light and sound? Yes, and that's very much intentional with uh, my hanging and wall pieces is that I want them to be uh, influenced by their environment. I want there to be an opportunity for them to change as light moves and the shadows shift. Um, I want people to, not this one, I don't particularly want people to touch it, but some of the other ones that I've done where the pieces hang out of the wall, 
that they can move and bounce with touch, I think is very important because again, then it's, it's a collaboration between yeah. me yeah. and the audience. Well, I have to say that for me, uh, this is one of the most uh, startling and original things uh, about your work because you just don't think of ceramics as, as having that as part of its, uh, the experience of a ceramic piece. Um, Martha, let's move on. This is beautiful, but it seems like a, almost like a tour de force uh, of your folded and uh, assembled pieces. So tell us how you got this together. So this piece, which is hanging in the, um, the National Harbor MGM complex colonnade um, at, uh, outside the casino. Um, when, when MGM came to this area and they said, we're, we're doing this whole project and our themes are the monuments and the water, and um, two main things, water and monument that, and they said, and we're looking for a piece that will reference that. And then they also said, and down the hall from you, there's gonna be another piece, which is, um, it's the constellation Leo in the ground. So, mm -hmm. right, so I said, okay, I've got an area from hanging from the ceiling next to a piece that's a sky piece in the ground. So I thought, well, what if I put a water piece in the ceiling? So the idea, my idea yeah. was a reflecting, like the reflecting pond um, only coming from the sky. So it's called cloud pool. It has a seal, steel substructure. Um, and I made all those ribbony pieces to, they are all, you know, there's about 300 ribbony pieces that were all made individually rolled out, shaped, draped, so forth and so on, and then kind of nested into each other hanging from the steel structure and the and then the center of it is glass um, that I uh, from crushed glass that I fused into these triangular diamond shapes that I wanted to be curved so some curve up some curve down again to kind of evoke wave action a little bit um, there's about 120 of those and then it's got lighting which changes so this particular one is showing the purple but it will go green or, or yellow or red depending on the lighting, which they're having a little trouble with at MGM, but. It, is okay. the lighting inside then? So yes. it's passing through the glass. And did you right. uh, fabricate the glass? I did, yeah. <laughs> and where do you fire? The, well, the... At, this was all made at Maryland Hall um, in Annapolis. I had a studio there for three and a half years. So I was able, and I fired some of my studio, my kiln at home, but, uh, but I basically used your a traditional ceramic kiln for all of these parts. Okay. I didn't need a, did not need a glass kiln to do it. Yeah. And so the, the individual porcelain pieces are of a small enough scale to fit in those uh, kilns they have at Maryland Hall. And it's the assemblage or the assembly that is so right. large. Exactly. Okay, I get right. It. Yeah. Well, it is both beautiful, but I am certainly in awe of the amount of physical uh, and mental effort that had to go into creating this. Um, so I see that we've already talked for almost a half an hour, and I do think there's lots of questions that the, the work is raising in my mind, and I hope in uh, our listeners. So let's move on so we can try and cover everything. And if you hear a scratching noise, that is my hungry dog who thinks that only I can feed her. So she's brought her dish and she's now playing with it behind me. Priorities, Will, priorities. <laughs> well, that's, those are her priorities right now, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, re I really like this because of the um, different forms and the connections between those forms and the colors and the scale. Now it's a little more intimate, uh, not that that's a, a criticism of any of the large pieces, but this is a little more, you know, approachable uh, in its mm -hmm. size and scale, of course. So I think it's just fascinating and um, tell us a little bit about Loves Me, Loves Me Not. So the name comes from um, that, that game you play as a kid where you pick the petals of the flower and you pick one, loves me, loves me not, and you go through that cycle. And it was um, created for a show where kind of the core of the show was, again, my parents' wedding picture in a different iteration. 
So a lot of the pieces that I developed around for that show kind of were in this theme of love, marriage, life, togetherness, con you know, and the both the the positive, the good parts and the the rough parts of that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's where the name comes from. And I was really trying to get both the fabric ribbony kind of feel and then a kind of organic floral behavior. Um, this is one of the first ones where I started integrating color into the clay itself as opposed to um, just the white uh, ribbon clay. So that was kind of a, a new fun thing for me. Um, and then again, in caustic, that was something new. So having this background where there, it created an environment as opposed to just the piece on the wall gave it a little bit more containment and structure, I guess. Did you create the encaustic? I did, yeah. Do you do yes. other paintings? Um, I do a little bit with encaustic, but I don't, I don't paint. What I like about encaustic um, is that it's, uh, I mean, it, I, you're using oil stick and wax. So it's a very thick um, tactile kind of juicy material. So it, it, it's, it has volume, I guess you would say which is what I like about it. Do those uh, flower-like pieces that are uh, draping down move? Yes, those are attached to sprung steel wire. Um, so they will bounce with vibration, they'll bounce with touch, and they're actually adjustable in length, which enables um, whoever is near the piece to kind of adjust what they're seeing or what it has. So there's this uh, opportunity to play. With the piece, uh, that, I think that's one of the most intriguing parts, uh, and for a lot of reasons, mostly because of the beauty and the uh, originality of putting them together. But as soon as I saw it, it reminded me of a, a sculpture that's similar um, in Montpelier, Vermont. Somebody took slender metal rods and attached river stones, small mm. ones, you know, about the mm -hmm. size of a fist. To them, and you could see them move mm -hmm. when the wind blew. Uh, right. So I, I think that inclusion of motion in something like this really, of course, makes it much more dynamic. It adds another whole level of uh, in enjoyment and uh, experience to it. So that's quite nice. And I apologize to my wife. I said it was her computer. It wasn't. It was our TV behind me that turned itself on, and I don't know how it did that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of have to explore that. Uh, a lot of distractions this evening. I apologize. Uh, next please, piece, please, Martha. <laughs> you got to tell me where this is. Uh, it's, down in, it's in someone's home in Dallas, actually. It's um, a divider wall between their entryway and their living room. So. And so it's, uh, it, it's visually a riff over um, the first piece. Mm -hmm. Is it any way related in your mind and intentionally? Um, certainly those brick, those cylindrical brick components um, I've used multiple times. And what I like about them is that they have volume, but then there's also this, you see through it. Yeah. Um, so, it's, so it's not just the piece itself, it's the space behind the piece that becomes part of it. And so that's consistent. Um, I, in this particular case, um, I wasn't thinking about that first piece. What I was really thinking about was um, kind of the movement of these particular pieces. So it's a little bit more organic than contained. And those, in my earlier uh, cup configurations, it, they were much more contained. And this one has much more kind of movement Th throughout the piece um, then. And it, and, it, and it was also, a lot of my pieces tend to be the, okay, what what is different about this situation? What's the new challenge? Um, so this one, the challenge was figuring out how to have it feel like it's just hanging there and floating without having a lot of structural, internal structure to it. So it was a little bit stressful I'll just say that right there. <laughs> Put this it really, what you were just saying really calls attention to something that I've noticed, but uh, I didn't feel like it was the right moment to ask. Are you always conscious of the, not just the ambient space, but the uh, interpenetrations of solid and mass, uh, of, of space and mass 
when you create a work? Is that something that you're conscious of as you begin? Um, I'm really, yes, I don't, I think as opposed to saying, and this piece was different because it was very intentionally built. Um, and a lot of my work tends to be, I'll make a bunch of parts and see what happens when they get next to each other. Um, so I'm, I'm aware that they're gonna occupy space and that there's gonna be some seeing through and beyond, and there's gonna be some hopefully relationship to the body of the viewer, whether it's where they're seeing it at or whether it can be handled and moved. Um, but I'm more interested in kind of the, um, the puzzle of what I have in front of me. What does this piece do to this piece? Mm -hmm. If I put this piece with that piece, what happens? Um, and so some pieces are made very intentionally and some pieces are made, as I said, with just, here's a bunch of parts, what can I do with them? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the weaknesses of, I think every art historian is that we're trained to kind of uh, categorize and pigeonhole. Uh, would it be fair to say that you're more of a sculptor than a ceramicist? Yeah, I would definitely say that. I am. I love the material and I love how it behaves, but I like how it behaves like other materials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that is one of the um, very original aspects of your work. I, and maybe I, I wasn't pushing too hard to pigeonhole you. <laughs> so uh, how many more do we have, Martha? But there's just or, one more, maybe. Just one more. Okay, let's yeah. look at it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I, I love this. It's so simple. It's so pure. On on lots of different levels for me. So is it what it seems to be? It's a duet between two people as well as two forms? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of my uh for me it's just all dancing it's all the this this happens and i do that i do this and that happens and so a lot of the pieces are about conversation or movement um and uh so this one uh is another one where i actually made the pieces separately just just made them and then these were two that worked together wow um and so it's just two pieces, they nest, they come apart and they balance because of their relationship with each other. That must have been a really special moment when you put them together and saw how they interacted and how they complemented each other. It's, it's really fun because, um, and, and challenging because I always wanna change them, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so part of me is like, this is great, this is perfect. And another part of me is like, but it could be this way too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that it's like it's that editing thing, knowing when to stop. Yeah, yeah. Is always a well. Challenge. You can always try another. You know, make some more. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, uh, it's been great talking uh, to you while we look at your work and uh, learning a little bit more about how they evolve, for, uh, physically and emotionally and aesthetically. And now I think it's time uh, for us to open it up for questions. Um, I, I apologize, this may just be my uh, limited uh, or parochial background, but I've never seen anything like what you've done, particularly in this material. Um, and I was wondering how it evolved, who, who were your influences um, and how did you get to uh, create, to the point of creating these remarkable things out of porcelain? Um, well, thank you for asking that. Um, I am, I, my influences in the art world tend to come after I do something in a way that it's kind of like, oh, I like that work because it reminds me of my work. <laughs> um, so, and then why is that? And then, then I take in, so for example, Richard Serra does these real, did these really large monolithic steel curls. And I think they're fabulous, right? And I love how I feel walking into that space. And one of these days I'm going to make one out of clay that, you know, is big like that. Um, and, but I was doing the work that I'm doing before I saw his work. I just, I love his aesthetic and it connects with mine. Um, and it really, um, I'm inspired by people who are really get into what they do to the point where it's no one else could do it in a way. And that, that, 
but but if you think about it, if somebody did it, then then anybody could do it. It's a matter of wanting to do it and how much how hard you want to work at doing it, and whether it you like it in the end when you're doing it. Um, so I'm I'm more influenced by um, abstract painters, and I can't particularly name ones. I just like that kind of work. Um, clothing design, fashion design, um, uh, pattern pieces, and how architect architectural forms work. Architecture. Um, so I'm more interested in that, and then family memories and history, than um, than a particular clay maker or a particular school of clay work. Elizabeth, your pieces are obviously made of a number of smaller pieces, and uh, I come from more from engineering than art, but uh, I was interested in how you put it all together. Um, for me, I like the I like small pieces because I like the the repetition. So there's kind of a meditative process when making similar forms over and over and over again. But in the making of similar forms, each form is different. You know, I can in that boat piece, I can tell you the three pieces that are my favorite out of all 899 pieces that are in there, one of which broke, unfortunately. Um, but each construction project, it's a construction project where, all right, um, if for the MGM one, I had to work with an engineer and figure and learn what what stresses are involved, what's the weight issues, what are you know what materials and tools are out there for um, hanging. So each one and the the piece in Dallas that um, that green wall panel, I had someone make the steel structure and then I made and that was in Dallas and I'm up here. Um, so I made a wooden structure frame that was the same to drill all the holes because all those ceramic pieces had to have holes drilled in specific spots. And so everything had to be measured. And then I was like, well, what units? Well, I don't want to have screws. So what tools? So you go to McMaster Car and you just browse through all their screws and nuts and bolts to figure out what's the one that does the job and what, you know, and you order five or six and try this one and try that one. So there's a lot of, and I, Home Depot wandering around. Oh, I'll, I started with all thread. And then I discovered um, sprung steel um, for my ex the extensions and so forth. So it was just a kind of trial and error and asking lots of questions. So in a way, the whole uh, mechanical world is part of your studio. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. I, lo I love it. And just walking through, you know, oh, that's a cool hook. What could I do with that hook? It just becomes a kind of, maybe the piece comes from that exploration. Hey, Marsha. Um, I, I think I, um, Chris answered some of my questions, but um, I was interested in how, like, did you drill holes in those little pieces to hang them up, or did you make the holes before you fired them? Yeah, I made the holes before I fired them. Each piece has a little wire loop stuck into it, and that wire is a high temperature wire that you can fire in place. Ah. That's why they, that, was, that, that was two of the seven steps, <laughs> two of the seven touches. <laughs> yeah, was, wow. yeah. couldn't, couldn't understand that. Yeah. <laughs> but I have drilled post firing on some pieces and the, the glass pieces were all, of course, all drilled post firing for those. Well, there's a whole level of complexity that, that talking with you has allowed me to understand, you know, because I was my my own studio's experience with ceramics is so limited. I was kind of thinking from that perspective, but your perspective is much broader and uh, much more complex. Uh, you're not, you're a sculptor, you're not a ceramicist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I well, view, go ahead. Good. I was just gonna say, I view it, I look at working with the clay in, in nowadays there's a lot of um, kind of subtractive work in the same way that a woodworker would do. because so I'll make forms and then I do a lot of shaving and carving and sanding mm. um, to get rid, to, to contour the foam. So some of them are thrown on the wheel as a, as a solid thick cylinder and then they're oriented this way and cut apart and shaped, but there's a lot of sanding mm -hmm. and shaving and wow. that wow. kind of thing that goes on. It's beautiful, the result is beautiful and fascinating. So unless there are some other questions, um, I've really enjoyed talking with you and uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to do this uh, and share your work with us all. So um, 
I think we'll call it a night. And Martha, should you or I say something about the immediate future of Will Talks? Uh, I can. Um, so Will Talks, this will be the last uh, episode of Will Talks of season three. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of a breather for the holidays. So you will not see another Will Talk until 2022. Unless something okay. very, very special happens, which at this point, I don't think we're doing anything in December. But yeah. Uh, if you would like to apply to be on a Will Talk and you're an MFA member, uh, shoot us an email info at mdfedart.org. And you can find a lot of info about Will Talks over on our website, mdfedart.org. Okay. Well, uh, thank you again, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you, Martha, for your uh, support. And thanks to all of you for listening in. And have a happy Thanksgiving and happy holidays. And I'll see you in 2022. Great. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Bye. Martha.